So folks, welcome to Isolation Bible Study. I'm Bill Tucker from Concordia in San Antonio. Uh, Pastor Zach is normally with us, but he is not uh, on today. In his place, we've got uh, someone that the Concordia folks will know and, and recognize, Pastor Paul Teske. And, and Paul is uh, one of my favorites, great teacher, uh, great leader, and he has agreed to join us and talk about one of the, one of the subjects that he teaches on with, with tremendous expertise. It's the topic of prayer. And so, Paul, welcome. It's great to have you Thank with you. me. Thank you, Bill. Pastor Bill, for uh, having me and uh, trusting me with your audience here. Absolutely. So what uh, what do you want to talk about today? What are you going to teach us? Well, you know, during this pandemic, uh, I've done some statistical reviewing, and it's said that the Bible sales are up 150% uh, over the right? last year. Uh, I said that uh, 44% according to Barna of the U.S., are looking for a deeper relationship with the Lord, uh, Bible study. There's a high interest in prophetic prophecy or prophetic word. So I think that tells me, at least, that people pretty much, you know, that are shut, shuttering or, or locked in are taking, uh, using this opportunity to get deeper with the Lord in, into their Bible. And certainly, I'm sure a lot of people are praying. In fact, they're probably Many people praying now that haven't spent as much time praying in the past. So prayer is very important. It's important to us as, as Christians because it's a communication line. So I thought I'd talk about three aspects of prayer. One's the Lord's Prayer, which is kind of Jesus's divine formula. Uh, then I want to talk about a, a personal guideline for prayer that I think we could be applicable to all of us. And then lastly, talk about, you know, basically, does God listen and hear anything we're saying anyway? Because Ultimately, that's the key. Does God really hear us when we pray? And I think a lot of people ask that question. Is, is the Lord listening? So those are kind of the three areas I wanted to uh, talk about. That sounds terrific. You know, one of the things we, we talk about a lot at Concordia, as you well know, is just the, the incredible gift that prayer is and the opportunity and that it's a vital part of our Christian life. So, dear brother, lead on. All right. All right. Well, you know, the Lord's Prayer is probably one of the most familiar and best known prayers uh, in, in the world. I mean, mo everybody in the Christian faith knows the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, there's about 63 words, give or take. Uh, and it's oftentimes regurgitated, you know, and God certainly hears it. But I think when Jesus gave it, it was given as a uh, as a divine outline uh, for prayer. It's not that we don't use the Lord's Prayer verbatim, but there's some components to it that I think are interesting, and it behooves us to kind of look at that. Now, there's two places in the Bible where you can find this. One's in Matthew 6, and the other's in, the, in Luke chapter 11. And for the sake of expediency, I want to look at Luke chapter 11, because I think in this passage, we find the succinctness of the prayer that Jesus gave. And I want to break it into to, uh, some components for, for us to just think about, all right? You know, if you look at the beginning of this text, it says Jesus was praying, and, and the disciples came to him and said, look, we see what you're doing. Uh, would you teach us to pray like that? Now, these were good Jewish men. They all knew how to pray. They had learned to pray from infancy on. Uh, that was just part of their, their routine, part of their rubric. But yet they saw something uniquely different in the prayer life of Jesus to the point that they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray like you pray. Because I think they also realized that when Jesus prayed, he was having results. <laughs> and don't you really kind of want results in your prayer life? Sure, I do. I mean, when Absolutely. I pray, I want uh, results and there, now there's an expectancy that God is going to not only hear me but respond to what I say. But let's go back to this divine formula. If you look at the version in Luke, it leaves out some components of the prayer that we see in the longer version that we pray, and you find part of this in, in Matthew, you find part of this in later manuscripts. But I, in particular, wanted to look at this section in Luke because I think it would help you understand this outline uh, in a more clear way. So it starts in verse 2, uh, Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father. And the word there in Greek is Abba. And what Jesus does, he takes this, this relationship and makes it uh, very informal. You know, he says, when you pray to God, he's not distant and remote. You don't have to go, you know, ring your bell and try to find him. He's there as your earthly father is there as a loving father, a, a companion, someone that you can go to. So Jesus says, look. When you pray, start with the words Abba or Father. And then he says, look, you need to recognize uh, who you're talking to. And so Jesus said, look, you're talking to a holy God. His name is holy. And he's a God. He's not just a man. He's a, or, or, or a 
a person. He's a person with a kingdom. He's a king. You know, thy kingdom come. And there's other components that are added later. Thy will be done. But the, initially, Jesus wants them to understand that they need to recognize who they're talking to. They're talking to a Abba Father who cares about them, who wants to be with them and, and respond to them. And then there are three components here uh, following this. The first one is found in verse 3. He says, give us today our daily bread. Now, if you think about that for a moment, it's talking about the present. You know, today I need bread. Today you need bread. We need resources. We need a God that can, can meet us in the moment for what we need. So this is a line. Give us today our daily bread. Talking about our, our moment today, right now, our, our present situation. And if you think about it, who is the supplier? It's the creator God. Our father in heaven is the creator God. He creates all things. So you've got the first person of the Trinity recognized here. So in this passage, you've got two things to remember. It's a present need being met by whom? The first person of the Trinity. And then it brings you to the second line. It says, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone else. Now, this is important because it takes us to the past. We, we sin in the past. You know, it's that's the place where we need redemption. And who is the one that takes care of our past? It's the second person of the Trinity. It's the Son. It's the Redeemer. The Redeemer who on the cross died for our sins and took care of all our sins. Now listen, what's important to understand is the literal understanding of this passage in the Greek is saying, look, forgive me to the extent that I'm able to forgive others. And so what that really means is, says, Father, forgive me to the within my capacity to forgive others. In other words, I'm saying, Father, don't forgive me unless I can forgive others. And I don't think any of us mean that when we pray that, right? I want forgiveness. God said, okay, if you want it, then you have to give it. You have to understand the importance of it. In fact, if you look at that version in Matthew, at the end of the prayer, he goes on and says, hey, forgiveness is very important. He, re he reiterates this. But think about this. Forgiveness is part of our past. That's where we sin. It's also taken care of by the Redeemer, the second person uh, in, in the Trinity. And it behooves us to not only receive, but to give out what we want to receive from God. If I can't forgive you, then shame on me. God says, look, it's not that I can't forgive you, Tessie, but you need to really forgive all those people that, that have hurt you or wounded you, maligned you in any way. And you say That's it's hard. Well, look, it may be hard for God to forgive me, right? I mean, how often do I abuse the Lord, abuse his name, you know, violate the law of the Ten Commandments? But yet God graciously without reservation, forgives me from the cross as he forgives you. Second we person talking, of the Trinity. Go ahead. We were talking about this uh, this weekend, Paul. Our theme was, you know, who are you? Are you known for who you're for or who you're against? And we're using the story of the woman caught in adultery from John 8. And, you know, it's interesting how easily and how quickly, instead of, instead of being forgiving, even as Christian people, we, we jump to judgment. You know, we, we're living in a culture that, that immediately rushes to judgment instead of forgiveness. And so this, this speaks directly to that. It's powerful. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, the Bible is very clear about judgment. You know, in Luke chapter 5, it says, the, uh, the way you forgive and judge people is the way it's going to be doled back to you. You know, if you judge, you're going to be judged. If you forgive, you're going to be forgiven. So it's, it's a thin line. We understand grace, the importance of grace. But I think God wants us to keep this in mind that we have a responsibility to reflect the light of Christ, which, in, which means we don't judge and we are freely able to release, forgive, and let go. All right. Yeah, so great. this brings me to the third part. And the third part is that you can already see where this is going. Lead us not into temptation. Or right? later in the, in, in the version of Matthew, it says, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. That's talking about our future. And who is the person in the Trinity that, that guides us, that, that leads us? It's the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier. So in this prayer, you have not only the, 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 uh, the present moment with the Father God, Creator God providing our needs. We have the past taken care of by the Redeemer, the Son who died on the cross. And then we have a prayer component asking God to lead us, to guide us into that appropriate place along our walk. Now, 
What, what's important about this? Jesus was giving this as a model for prayer. We can certainly regurgitate this and pray this as the Lord's Prayer, which it is. But he also, I think, wants us to expand on this, to take each one of these lines and to extrapolate something from that that's relevant to our life in the moment that we can apply to us, understand how we need to look at our future situation. I mean, many people right now are out of work. You know, in the moment, they're hurting. But we have a God who provides. Many people are looking back and second-guessing themselves and thinking about decisions they made. We have a God who redeems us. We have other people who are fearful right now of taking one step forward. They don't know what's going to happen, you know, one step at a time. But, you know, the Bible tells us clearly we walk by what? By faith and not by sight. So God said, look, I'm going to guide you. I'm going to lead you. And by the way, I love you so much. I'm going to hold you by the hand. I'm not going to throw you under a bus. I'm going to walk this out with you. And so what, what I'm trying to tell you is that as you pray this prayer, extrapolate from it for your own life, your own needs, your own circumstance, and ask the God of creation, the God of redemption, the God of sanctification to meet you in that place and, and to help you. Now, this brings me to my second part, and I want to talk about what I'm going to call personal guidelines for prayer. Oftentimes, you know, when I pray, it's often because of the pressing need of the moment. And I focus on my need. And, you know, and I hammer on it. I mean, that's, that's where I want to be. But here is a, another way of approaching your personal prayer life. And I think this will help you. There, there are four components to this. Number one, you need to recognize, as Jesus did in the Lord's Prayer, who you're praying to. The God of all creation. A, a perfect God. A God of redemption and love. A God who is awesome. A God with, with whom all things are possible. And in that context, you begin to praise God and give him adoration. You know, start your prayer focusing on the God you're praying to and praise him and give him adoration and just elevate his name, you know, and, and take a while. So maybe get some praise music and play it in the background. But spend some time just focusing on who it is you're talking to. It's not me. It's not Pastor Bell. It's, it's the living God of all creation who's opened a pathway to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, we access the Father because of his son. Jesus makes that uh, possible for us. But who are we praying to? God, it's, if you walked into, uh, I need to be careful how, but if you walked into the Oval Office, regardless of who's the president, you'd be in awe. Wouldn't you? I'd be in awe. I mean, yeah. being in the Oval Office, that would be pretty amazing. We are in the Oval Office of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Begin to give him adoration and praise. And then that brings me to the second part. Go into a mode of, of thanksgiving. What do you have to be thankful for? If you're hearing me right now, you've got ears. If you're watching me, you've got sight. You're listening to me speak. You can speak. You know, we have so much. We have families. We have church. We have a job. We have communities. There's so much that we can be thankful for. And if you begin to make an inventory, just begin to write down, what is it that you have to be thankful for for yourself or for your family or for your friends or, or for your church, your nation? You know, go into a mode of thanksgiving. I guarantee you will never exhaust the list if you write out what it is you truly have to be thankful for. Paul, it's interesting because one of the things that's been very powerful to me is, is to hear and to spend some time during this whole crazy COVID-19 crisis with all the uh, associated things that are happening to think about and to hear from people who are saying, you know, in the midst of this, I'm thankful for this situation, or I'm and literally, I've heard folks say, I'm thankful for COVID-19 because it, it this changed or this happened, or my eyes were open to this circumstance or this relationship was improved. So there are lots of struggle points, right? Lots of bad things sure. that have happened. But there are also some good things, and, and God wants us to be looking for and articulating that gratitude. You know, every day, Rivers and I talk about the state of the nation. How we, where's this going to go? You know, the, the church is being maligned in so many ways. There's talk about taking down the statues of Jesus and breaking stained glass. And, you know, and you know what? My response is always the same. I say, Rivers, our God is, is God. With him, all things are possible. He knows what he's doing, and, and we can trust him. Look, it may not, in the moment, may not show me an outcome that I want, but my God is in control. He, if our God's not in control, we're in trouble. If we can't trust our God, we're, we're in trouble. 
If our God's not good, we're in trouble. Our God is all of that. And he's got everything under control right now. You and I look around in the natural and we go, wow, this is really bad. But in the supernatural, God says, look, I know what I'm doing. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. You know, look, I don't, I, I, there are outcomes I want right now that I'm, I'm still waiting on. But with my God, all things are possible. I know my God will make a way. And that's what I'm talking about in this prayer life. When you begin to pray and recognize with your God, all things are possible. Your God's good. You can trust your God. He loves you. Then you can begin to thank him. And look, thank him in advance for the things that you're, you want. I mean, God says in the word, I'll give you the desires of your heart. And say, Lord, I'm going to claim, I'm going to, I'm going to ask for that. Give me the desire of my heart, yeah. you know? And that brings me to the third point. And this is what I call petitions, which is praying for others. Start thinking about those people out there that need a covering of, of your peril. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe not you. I'm talking about others right now. Begin to think about other people that you need to lift up in prayer. People that are needy. People that are hurting. People that are in the hospital. People that are sick. People that are unemployed. People that, you know, don't have legs. I mean, just the list again. Can, you can't exhaust that list. And if you begin to think about other people that you need to pray for, sin uh, sincerely pray for them, take into the throne room of, of God and say, Lord, I want you to bless this person or that person. Yeah, they, I, they're, I know their need. I want you to guide my heart to that person so I can pray. I, I Again, if you begin to make a list of people that you need to pray for, you can't exhaust that list either. And it's a wonderful thing when you begin to just see the needs that are out there that you can pray for, right? And that brings me to my last thing, which is yourself. Okay, you know, I'm not diminishing you, but I can promise you that by the time you get your own personal needs, compared to all the things you've been yeah, thanking God for and, and all the people you've been praying for, they may not be as important in the moment as you thought they were. Now, it's not diminishing. Yeah, my needs are important. And I'm going to ask the Lord to take care of my stuff. And I'm going to lay them before him. I know he already knows it, but I, he's my father. And I'm going to share with him what my needs are. Now, when I've given this formula to people, you know, that could say, look, Pastor, I, could, I couldn't pray 60 seconds. Uh, maybe maybe two minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. And for them, you know, 10 minutes seemed like an eternity. But they would come back with, from these four steps, recognizing the God of, of, of you're praying to for thanksgiving, praying for others and yourself, they'll come back to me inevitably and say, wow, I prayed for an hour. I blew this. Up. I couldn't believe it. I had no idea that I had that capacity. You know, it's because we have to focus appropriately. And as we focus appropriately, God will take us down that pathway. And time really means nothing. You know, because we come up, and, and let me tell you what, it, it will exhaust you <laughs> when you pray like that. It'll also fade with joy. And you'll get excited and you'll start praying more often. So this, I, I call this a personal guideline for prayer. I've taught this all over the world. And, and people can, can get their mind around this because it, it's personal. You know, it's personal between you and your God. It's personal in the Thanksgiving realm. It's personal in, in praying for others. And it's certainly personal when you begin to pray for yourself. Paul, well, I now, want to circle back to one thing that you said. Because yeah. point number four was that prayer for yourself. Yeah. And sometimes I talk to people who say, hey, listen, Pastor, you know, I pray for all kinds of people. I pray for, for people on the church prayer list and all of that, but I never pray for myself as if that's somehow, you know, because they don't want to be selfish or they don't want to be uh, 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 self-centered in their prayer life. Talk about that for just a minute. Yeah, well, then look, I think that's, a, you know, that, that's um, when people come to me for healing prayer. You know, I'll say, if you ask God to deal with this, they'll say, well, you know, he's too busy. You know, th this is not that important. And I said, let me tell you, my children, if they had an ingrown toenail, it was important to me. If they had a splinter in their finger, it was important to me. How much more will your heavenly father look at your circumstance and not want to wrap his arms around you? The reason you don't approach it is because you're, for two reasons, I think. One is low self-esteem. Am I really that important? And then secondly, what if he doesn't respond? You know, I'm going to be let down. Now, I, in that context, I say, look, I've got three adult children and, and, two, and three grandchildren now, and there's nothing I wouldn't do for any of them. 
I would bend over backwards. If they came to me with a need, I would do everything within my human capacity as a father or grandfather to help them. Why? Because I love them. And, you know, there's a great passage in Luke where Jesus says, how much more if you're, you know, you ask for bread, your heavenly father will give you this or thus and give you that. How much more? Well, if our heavenly father will far exceed Paul Tesca's father, and you have to get your mind around that. In God's eyes, you're his child, and you count. You have supreme importance uh, in his eyes. And, and, and ask him. Challenge him. And that brings me to this third point that I wanted to talk about. You know, it's about <clears throat> talking to God and understanding that God hears you and responds. You know, if you went to the doctor and you said, you know, I'm, I'm feeling whatever, and you sat there in his presence and you told him, Everything was going on, and he just sat there mute and didn't say anything. You'd get frustrated, right? Yeah, you'd, for sure. You said, "What am I wasting? My, what am I here for? I came to tell you what's wrong with me, and you're not saying anything." We have an expectation that when we talk to people like a physician, that he's going to respond to us. Well, look, you need to have that same expectation with God. God not only hears you, but He's speaks to you. You know, I do a whole teaching. It's called it's called How to Hear God. Why do I teach this? Because those people so often pray and they see it as a one side uh, event, one sided an event, but it's not. It's a two sided because God answers every single prayer. We just need to be able to tune in and understand how he's responding. Because when you can open your spiritual ears, the ears of your heart, and begin to tune into the God and, and however he speaks to you. You're going to be blown out of the water. I think too often because of the noise around us, uh, the distractions in our world, we, we cry out to the Lord, but we don't hear him. And listen, when the Lord's talking to Paul Tusky, I don't want to miss it. <laughs> I don't want to miss it in God saying to me. I mean, come on, if I'm talking to him, there's a man named Bob Bodine who wrote a book called Two Chairs. I was just thinking of that very book. Um, two chairs, a great book. And he says, every day I sit in one chair and I look across at the, at the empty chair and, and I see God sitting there. And I talk to God just like I would be talking to you right now in Zoom in a one-on-one. -on -one. I talk to him and with and I wait because I say, Lord, you know, here's what's going on. I need to hear from you. What, what do you think about this? And in the book, Bob says, look, I believe God, if you approach God in that posture, God, and give God time to respond and listen for his voice. You're going to begin to hear uh, his responses, maybe not audibly, but maybe in your heart or your mind. You know, you get an idea. My grandson's in the other room. He's 23 years old, just graduated from college. And he read this book his freshman year. My grandson, this is honest truth, spends every day, spends at least 10 minutes to sharing with God. It may be in his car driving to school. Uh, it's in his office, but every single day, and he comes to me all the time and says, Granddaddy, I'm amazed at, at the, the, the downloads I get from God, not only about stuff, but in my business life. You know, he's living here because, um, you know, the pandemic, he graduated in December, he's going to get an apartment, but his roommates are, are stuck, one's in Chicago, one's up in the, the Northeast, so he's waiting for them to get down here so they can, they've got to get jobs yet. He was fortunate. He got a job right out of the chute working for an investment banker. So he's living in our guest bedroom, saving rent. And, um, you know, but but he two chairs every day. And I would encourage you to try that. Find the book, first of all, Bob Bodine, Two Chairs, read it. He'll explain it to you. It's very simple. Yeah, and you can start to look. And you need to implement. You, you know, you, you don't do it once and say, oh, it didn't work. No, you, you pour in. You press in. You know, I love Luke 18. Jesus tells the disciples a parable about a woman who was persistent. Why? And it says in the first verse, he told them so they would not lose heart. That they would persist. And prayer is about persistence. You know, it's, it's praying, uh, believing, and, and waiting uh, to hear God's voice. So let's, so let's remind folks Paul. again, Paul. So the book is Two Chairs. It's by Bob Bodine, B-E-A-U-D-I-N-E. And right, right. great book. You can get it. You can get it uh, from Amazon. You can get it sure. in a Kindle version, electronic version, or a paperback. Uh, it's also available in Audible if you if you listen to books. But it's a great book. 
So let's talk for just a minute, because you you mentioned that your grandson may may two cheer with God, you know, driving to school or driving to work or something like that. So it's not it's not something that's formulaic where you have to do it a certain way and sit in a certain posture and be in a certain place. It really is about dedicating the time and and having that intentional interaction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For him, it works. You know, he had, in his car. You know, he would he would find and a lot of times he would go out. You know, he lived in a, in a house with five guys a bailer. He found that there was so much noise in that house, you know, five bedrooms, but he would uh, go for drives. That's why he found his solace and peace in, in quiet time uh, uh, with the Lord. Now, look, I'm in, Bo- actually, I'm in Bodine's book because I, there was some things that happened in our relationship, and he referenced me in the book somewhere. But I, Bob Bodine does it intentionally. He goes into a chair and sits there and talks to the Lord. But he also well, do that too. That's, that's the way I do it. I go into a chair in my living room. And I talk to the Lord. Uh, but he talks about how his daughter actually does it on a morning run every day. Yeah, she yeah. does. She goes on a run and she takes time. So if people are walking, if they're exercising, it's about that. It's about that intentional interaction. No. So so think about it this way: if you're there's somebody in your life that you hold very dear, you know, somebody important. I don't, that you could go to and talk to on a regular basis. You'd be foolish not to take advantage of that opportunity. Now I'm talking about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe that we can talk to and access 24 seven. And the reason we don't do it is because we get too often wrapped up in the natural world. But I want to, I want to encourage you to begin to pursue the supernatural God and, and spend this time with him and, and, and don't, just press in. Don't lose heart. Be, keep pressing in. Use this guideline. And I'm going to go back to the guideline for a moment. Recognize who you're talking to. Thanksgiving, praying for others, then your own needs. Use this formula and, and, and let your prayer life be extended. You know, it doesn't matter when you do it, where you know. God's everywhere. He's not deaf. He hears everything. Uh, he's all powerful. And he's available for you to access at any time in any way. He's just waiting. He's waiting for you, right? Absolutely. And you know, there there are lots of folks who uh, who have that self esteem issue, or sure. they're keenly aware of their own sin, their own faults, and they say to themselves, "There's no way God would listen to me." That's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell itself, right? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. God wants to hear from all of us, and because He loves sinners, and we're all in that category. Absolutely. You know. God loved us so much, he sent his only son to die for us, you and me. That gives value right there. How important are you? Somebody died for you, not just somebody. It was God's only son. So look, how if, if there's a value you want to put on your life, it's the death of Jesus Christ. That's your value. So God could redeem you. And you got to get your mind around that. And you got to get your heart around it. you got to believe it. I know you believe it. You just have to embrace it. And let God, look, let him flush out that low self-esteem and replace it with the image that he sees. When God sees you, he sees a beloved son or daughter that he loves very much. And he wants you to see yourself with the eye, with his eyes. So when you look in the mirror, see what God sees. You know, I often think about creation. It says in Psalm 139, God created each of us, each of us, in his image. Yeah. There's no bad image of God. <laughs> When you look in the mirror, you you see exactly what God made, and it is absolutely astoundingly beautiful, handsome, whatever. God didn't make any mistakes when he created you. You've got to get your mind around that because self-esteem through the eyes of God is elevated. You know, don't let any man or woman uh, suppress you with their image. You know, you weren't created in their image. You were created in the image of God. You're precious. Amen. I Amen. could go on to that for two hours on that, but you're special. You know, what I what I was thinking about, Paul, is the, the teaching that you have on how to hear from God. We yeah. really need to schedule a time to come back and do that in this Bible to. as well. So we'll uh, then I'll talk afterwards and we'll figure that out. As usual, I've got two and a half pages of notes as I was trying to scribble down what you were teaching. And so I hope uh, hope the rest of you have been blessed as I was to to learn about or maybe be reminded of prayer, reminded of God's approach to prayer and and having some practical ways 
that we can interact with God and engage this beautiful, amazing privilege of prayer. And so uh, thanks, Paul, for being with us. Always awesome when you're when you're around. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Concordia. So, dear friends, I hope you have a great, great rest of the day. Pastor Zach will be with you. I think we're going to be talking about a psalm uh, on Friday. But uh, God bless you. We love you. Hope you have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon.